just go ahead and get started. Yeah, I think we can go ahead, Sally. Uh, welcome everyone to the NDSA uh, uh, store Infrastructure Interest Group. Um, uh, Sally's arranged a, a great panel yes. for us today yes. on cloud infrastructure, cloud storage infrastructure. <laughs> Find something to talk about. <laughs> And um, just a, a housekeeping reminder, um, if people could keep themselves on mute when they're uh, not talking, yeah. just to help keep down the, the noise a bit. Um, there is a community notes document. The uh, link is in the uh, chat. Um, also, please add yourself to the present list for, for attendance. Um, thank you, and take it away, Sally. Great. Um... I'll turn on my video for one minute here and just wave at you all. <laughs> all right. Um, hey, Sally Vermont and Gates Archive. Um, so really what I'm going to do is um, basically quickly hand over to um, the great folks that agreed to um, present on cloud use cases and um, service offerings. Um, so, uh, is Julian Morley on the call yet? Yes, I am. I'm here. Hi. Hey, Julian. Okay, great. So the overall structure of um, this call is five to eight minute kind of lightning talks um, with a couple of minutes of questions after each one. I'll be, um, I'll be, I'll be doing the timer over here on my end. Um, but we have, we also should have some space for questions at the end. Um, so if we don't get them all in in those couple minutes after each lightning talk, um, note them down and save them to the end. All right, yeah, so first up, um, yeah, Julian Morley um, from Stanford has kindly agreed um, to talk a little bit about their, um, their approach to cloud storage and digital preservation. So over to you, Julian. Thank you, Sally. Okay, so um, unfortunately I don't have any slides to share. Um, I have an internal slide deck, but frankly that does not need to see the light of day. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna give a, a brief chat about what we, currently, what we are currently doing for object preservation and what we are about to start doing in probably about two to four weeks time. Um, so, here at Stanford, we have something called the Stanford Digital Repository, which is our digital object repository. Uh, it is a preservation layer behind um, the uh, behind a Fedora 3 repository and various homegrown tools and workflows that we've grown up around them over the last well, eight years or so. Um, we use Mob as our ape. And for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with Moab. It's um, a homegrown uh, forward delta file structure um, that's based off of Bagots and other preservation ideas that we've had floating around. We've been using it since 2007-ish, 2008-ish, I think. And it's been great. Um, it's showing its age in a couple of areas. Um, but our main problem from a preservation perspective is that we had grand ideas in sort of 2010 or so to leverage Moab to uh, do true archiving of objects, but we never kind of got around to it. We just kept using our existing system. So our problem today or as of last year was how do we take uh, what are essentially a series of NFS mounts we have 16 NFS mounts right now, a total of 500 terabytes worth of data, mob objects spread across those NFS mounts. The problem was how do we actually archive these objects in a sustainable, scalable way? Uh, right now we're using IBM, I almost called it Tavoli Storage Manager, they renamed it IBM Spectrum Protect uh, to back up these 15 mounts. And whilst TSM is great, and it does a lot of really cool things. Uh, we have not been using it to archive these objects. We've been using it as a backup solution. So um, this poses some challenges. Uh, one of them is that the uh, digital repository, SDR, is not aware of the status of any backups that TSM makes. Uh, 
It's also a problem. Another problem is that uh, TSM has difficulty with many small files. Uh, this means that our backup window can take a long time. We've done some hacks using NetApp to get around that, but it's a vendor solution relying on another vendor solution uh, to work around a structural problem with backing up Moabs. So that's not been great. Um, another problem is IBM Spectrum Protect is surprisingly expensive. Who to thunk that a vendor provided commercial solution that is really feature rich turns out to be somewhat expensive to run in production. Um, and also another issue that we've had is that we haven't been able to have, um, uh, we have instant access requirements for objects that are in our preservation layer. So that's prevented us from doing some of the obvious things to make our backups faster and easier to manage. So anyway, um, our solution to this has been uh, a software development project that's been going on for about nine months. It has an internal name, which I've been told we have to change because it doesn't sound cool. Um, but we're all friends here, so I'll tell you, it's, it's called Prescat, Preservation Catalog. Um, i say we need to come up with a, with a nicer name, although I have this really cool icon of a cat in a box, which I think is really super relevant. Um, anyway, the key features of Prescat is that it catalogs all of the online modules on, on disk. It gives SDR the visibility into all those mob objects, not just the stuff that's on disk, but also the archive copies. Um, and this is the thing that I think the infrastructure core is perhaps most interested in. It enables archives to any S3 compatible object store based on policies. Um, so what we've been doing for that is uh, we have an API. The API is aware of all of these. Sorry, we have the preservation catalog uses an API to detect online copies of MOAB, so those MOAB objects on NFS disk, to track them, work out which ones have or have not been replicated to defined S3 endpoints, and if they haven't been replicated, to package them up and get them out there to the cloud. We're targeting um, Amazon S3 with a lifecycle policy to Glacier to start, but we're also looking at um, Oracle's Cloud Storage Archive, um, Wasabi S3, and um, Oh, there was a third one, uh, Iron Mountains uh, Iron Archive. Um, that one is slightly less likely because there's some cost concerns there. Um, along the way, we've also added fixity checking um, and uh, is there anything else we've added to it? Fixity checking is the big one. Uh, anyway, so our intention is that we're going to be. Uh, the code is, we're about 90% of the way there. Right now, we've just started testing out our workflows to get copies to the cloud. It works. Uh, so we have now just scalability issues of using uh, Snowball to seed um, our initial Amazon archive. And then we're just gonna burn it in for six to nine months to make sure that it all works as we expect. And then hopefully, we'll be able to get rid of IBM TSM and sending to physical tape. All right, so that's the presentation portion of this. Uh, Sally, uh, do you want to go to questions or move on to the next person? Yeah, um, let's go. Let's go on to questions. So um, I already see one in the chat here. Um, so what's Snowball? Oh, uh, uh, Snowball. I'm sorry. That's that's my, my <laughs> crappy pronunciation there. Um, <laughs> by elocution, I must work on it. It's, Amazon. it's an Amazon product. It is a physical box. There we go. That uh, you and just posted in the in, in, in chat, they ship you a box basically that has an S3 interface that is identical to a target bucket that already exists in S3. You slurp your data onto that box, ship it back via UPS, and then they ingest it into Amazon. It's great if you want to have, if you want to migrate anything from 30 to 80 terabytes at a pop into the cloud and you don't have a, a really beefy pipe. Now, we actually do have a very beefy pipe into the internet, but even with our crazy connections, Snowball still seems like it's going to be worthwhile for us. Great. Any other questions for Julian? Feel free to type them into the chat or to um, just ask. Julian, any idea yet how um the Oxford Common File System might fit into things, which might be a good future topic for this group to talk about as well. I was just well, making Yes, yeah, so OCFL is very much at the forefront of my mind. I mentioned right at the start that there were a couple of uh, structural issues with Moab that uh, we want to address. 
Uh, and so OCFL, one of my goals for OCFL is to be able to address those structural issues. And um, the intention is, from Stanford's perspective, to have OCFL as a wrapper that we can just put around our existing MOAB objects to make them easier to manipulate when they're in an archive format. Um, archive format in this context basically means taking a version directory that has anywhere from 50 to 5,000 files in it, make it into one or more zip segments, and then sending those zip archives uncompressed uh, up to a cloud provider and then just tracking the zip segments. So we intend for OCFL to support that. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Julian. That was our two minutes of question time. Um, that was fantastic. So if you have more questions for Julian, just note them down and we should hopefully have some time at the end, but want to make sure um, we get through everyone's presentations. Great. Great. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Julian. Um, all right, so next up on the docket, um, we have uh, Bill Brannon from uh, Duraspace. Bill, are you on the call? I am. Hi, everyone. Fantastic. And we can see your screen. Perfect. Perfect. OK, um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit very briefly about, about DuraCloud and, and hopefully answer some of the questions that uh, are intended to be addressed here. Uh, so, but certainly interrupt me or or chime in with questions afterwards. Uh, so, just quickly, first, kind of what is DuraCloud? Um, it, I'm, I'm talking about it here today because DuraCloud is is really primarily a system for moving content uh, into from from local systems into cloud storage or uh, preservation networks. We actually started DuraCloud uh, with a variety of different uh, cloud storage options and and we've narrowed a bit on on the cloud systems uh, primarily based on what people have told us they want um, but also added preservation networks because that uh, brings in a, a, a different uh, use case and, and set of needs so it's it's really intended to be as simple as possible to get uh, content in and out storing really any kind of file we don't make any requirements around the the size or, or types uh, or structure of the content that is being stored it's intended to take whatever you have um, and and uh, allow you to uh, use it and and adjust as needed over time. Uh, the The primary features of DuraCloud are uh, allowing for things like uh, duplication between providers, so you can actually take con push content into DuraCloud once uh, and and have it land in a few different storage locations, which uh, reduces the the need to manage all that uh, locally. And it provides verification through uh, a scheduled content checksum. So, uh, as content goes in, it's it's checked to verify that what what uh, was local is the same as uh, as the content that lands in storage. But also, uh, there's a, a manifest that's kept to ensure that the that the content is um, uh, the content list is maintained. And and then we also pull the content out piece by piece. Uh, and verify that it is uh, the checksum still match after time. So uh, it is open source software, and it, it's been deplo deployed not only by DuraSpace as DuraCloud, but also uh, by ForScience as DuraCloud Europe, and as a, a DuraCloud offering by Texas Digital Library. Um, and we're currently working with a group in Canada to potentially uh, offer DuraCloud there as well. So a few of the benefits. Uh, it's, it's intended to support uh, libraries and archives. That's the primary uh, folks that, that Duraspace uh, uh, is uh, on mission to support. So that's that's our primary uh, community. And uh, so part of that is having integrations with systems like DSpace, Archivematica, Archivit to be able to easily pull in content. Um, we actually offer a completely uh, separate service called Archives Direct uh, that is in partnership with Artifactual for um, allowing hosted uh, Ar Archivematica uh, that pushes content uh, after its completed processing into DuraCloud. So the there are a, a set of tools, uh, we call them the sync and retrieval tools on the DuraCloud side to, that help get content in and pull it back out again. 
Uh, we've, we've done some experimentation with uh, the Snowball and, and some of the other um, shipping disks uh, options that uh, Julian mentioned, but primarily uh, we, we tend to use just over the wire transfers because uh, the, the level of effort to get things uh, set up and then transferred and then uh, reorganized tends to take longer in the long run than, uh, than actually just starting a transfer and waiting in for it to, for it to complete. Um, and as I noted, we do do automated health checking of files uh, over time. And of course, uh, the benefit of the service is that you get to have uh, assistance, support, training, that sort of thing from, from DuraSpace. And uh, we do take out some of the uh, complexities of AWS uh, and, and other cloud uh, billing systems by just uh, providing a, a yearly invoice. So a couple of the uh, storage options to start, of course, Amazon S3 and Glacier. Uh, you don't have to choose both, but you can you can choose just S3 or S3 and Glacier. Uh, there's also uh, Chronopolis, uh, which I imagine most of you know something about, but it's a, a university-based uh, dark uh, archival digital preservation system that uh, uses DuraCloud as kind of the front end to get content into the into the network and in a similar way uh, deepen the digital preservation network uses DuraCloud to get uh, content uh, into the the network for for preservation purposes so there's a few plans uh, noted here just uh, primarily broken out based on size uh, so uh, the goal is to provide DuraCloud as as cheaply as possible for um, for everyone to be able to make use of it. Uh, I won't go into great detail about plans. You can certainly go to the website to find out more about that. So a few usage patterns uh, that we've seen with regard to this is uh, things that are really not surprising. Um, S3 and Glacier storage is, is usually used uh, to keep a secondary or, or tertiary copy of uh, content uh, after it's been deemed preservation worthy. Uh, we actually have uh, one customer that uh, that keeps, I think, the seventh and eighth copy of their content in uh, in those two systems, and uh, it's also used very often uh, S3 in particular to store content that is uh, yet to be assessed. So if if it's content that's come in, there's nowhere to put it. Uh, so in the meantime, it goes into DuraCloud, and then they pull it back down to to try to do some kind of assessment of of the data. Uh, or if it's derivative content, very often um, uh, there's preservation content in one, what we call a space, which is similar to an S3 bucket, um, and then derivative content in other spaces that may or may not need to be um, duplicated within DuraCloud. Um, and sometimes they don't, uh, they're not duplicated anywhere else either. Uh, so DuraCloud does provide for streaming video and audio. This isn't something that's used um, as a as a major activity by a lot of our customers, but some use it fairly heavily. We're actually right uh, in the moment uh, right now working on an, an up update to that uh, capability just to make it a little bit more uh, consistent with uh, HTML5 capabilities. And and then Deepin and Chronopolis are the content that goes there tends to be really focused on uh, content that has been well understood and and needs to be preserved for a long period of time. So a, a few considerations uh, for just those looking for uh, cloud-based uh, preservation. One, it really helps to know your content and, and know how you expect to use it. There's a lot of uh, small costs that can add up to very big costs if you use the content in, in a way that uh, is different than, than you set up your storage uh, to uh, be most efficient for. Um, you should plan for outages. These don't happen often, but when they do, you just don't have access to your content. Um, so if you really need access, uh, next bullet here, keep, keep a local copy. Uh, and of course, it's always a good idea to have copies in different uh, distributed locations. So the more that you can do that, uh, the better off you're going to be. Uh, as, uh, as noted before, uh, it can take some time to transfer content over the wire. So you know your network, know what your capabilities are and have, have expectations that are in line with the amount of content you have and the amount of um, network bandwidth you have. Uh, you want to keep up with the capabilities of whatever providers you're using. Uh, Amazon in particular tends to add an awful lot of new capabilities um, in very short amounts of time. And so sometimes those really bring uh, significant 
uh, benefits that can uh, lower your costs or simplify your workflow. Of course, uh, trust and verify. Uh, there, there's a lot going on um, in the cloud space. Uh, and so you want to expect that uh, things are going to go well, but also verify that it did. And then um, automate as much as possible, because that gets the, the biggest cost of this very often is, is staff time. Uh, and getting that uh, out of the way with, with regard to automation very often uh, brings your cost down as, as much as it can be. So. Uh, so that was it. Um, just wanted to see uh, if there's any any questions at this point. Great. Um, thank you, Bill. That was right at eight minutes. Well done. <laughs> so we have two minutes for questions. Any questions for Bill? All right, Bill, it looks like you may be off the hook here. Sounds like it. <laughs> okay. I'll just note that okay. I'm going to have to drop here uh, probably at the half hour. So if there's any, okay. any questions, feel free to shoot them to me via email. Okay. Great. Oh, oh wait, we do have a question that's come in. Ewan asks, um, I have a general question for everyone. How scalable? Are your integrity checking routines across diverse storage op options? So maybe, maybe Bill, um, you could address that first, and then other people could respond in the chat. Sure. Um, so uh, I'll say first the the some of the the storage providers we use, um, we don't specifically manage the um, integrity checking, uh, like the Chronopolis and Deepin networks both have their own internal. And check and integrity checking that is is done, um, you know, because they have access to the content. And uh, in terms of uh, scalability with regard to the S3 and, and Glacier, um, it's it's built within the AWS uh, system. So uh, uh, using auto scaling and and various other capabilities, it is actually scales uh, quite well. And uh, we haven't had any problems at least recently with uh, being able to handle the the load of the content we have. Okay, great. If I yeah. can just jump in, this is Julian from Stanford again. Um, we are not explicitly fixed to checking the stuff that we send to the cloud. Once it's the cloud, we're trusting the vendors. We are fixed to checking our local content regularly, and that's horizontally scalable with our system infrastructure. It's not a big deal. Um, well, uh, we're spot checking content that we're sending to the cloud, but there is no practical way to do regular fixed checking of three remote copies in three different cloud providers. So we have to trust them that when they say they don't do bit rot, they don't do bit rot. Um, and our fix is we do discover an object in the cloud that is corrupt, we replace it with one of the other three copies that we have in different systems. Great. Um, there's also been, if others have responses to this, feel free to add in the chat. Um, so Mickey has asked, um, also another general question to everyone, how is deleting handled between local and remote copies as an in intentional deleting from the archive, for example, due to contractual obligations? We do have just a minute left for question or here if anyone wants to respond off the cuff. Otherwise, um, feel free to respond in the chat. Yeah, I, I could, this is Julian again. So we do it by aging out the backups with our existing mob, which is kind of sucky. Uh, you know, delete the local copy, wait 90 days, we know that it's gone from the backups. For the, the new Prescat, when the system's operational, we have a very, not convoluted, but a very thorough workflow to handle the identification and deletion of content once it's gone to S3. Uh, the system is designed to be worm, so write once, read many. We have safeguards in place because we do not want accidental deletion of content. It does mean that deleting content becomes a bit of a chore, but I'd rather it was a thoroughly documented chore 
than an accidental loss of a few hundred terabytes of data. That makes sense. That sounds like a good trade off. <laughs> And I'll, I'll just throw in um, on the DuraCloud side, uh, we actually are intentional about allowing uh, deletion to within S3 at least to be uh, more straightforward uh, because expect, it's expected that the content in, S in DuraCloud is uh, going to be more actively used. Uh, so the, the client tooling allows you to make decisions about what should happen on content delete for, from local copies. Um, so you know, options are do nothing or uh, or or perform the delete. Um, that it's different, of course, within Chronopolis and Deepin, where a request needs to be made uh, to delete an individual file. Great. Thank you both. Um, great. All right. Um, so let's move on to. Um, our next presenter, who is Kamel Hussein from um, Microsoft Azure Archive. Kamel, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Hi, Sally. Hey. Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and having me here. I'm very excited to talk with everyone today. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Kamel Hussein. I am a product manager in the Microsoft Azure Storage Group, uh, specifically leading our archive storage offering. Uh, last year in December, we launched archive storage, uh, which is Azure's cold storage offering uh, for data that is rarely accessed, stored long term, and can tolerate several hours of retrieval latency. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with Glacier, um, this is our compete uh, uh, product offering to that. Um, and, and the great thing about Archive is that we launched it at an industry leading price of um, two tenths of a cent per gigabyte month um, or two dollars per terabyte uh, month. Um, we made this available in 14 regions across the globe. Um, so we're in all, all eight U.S. public regions. Uh, we're in EMEA, um, APAC, and then we're slowly expanding to several other regions as well. And um, some of the other benefits um, <clears throat> that you get with archive storage is that uh, we, we placed a huge emphasis in integrating it with our current um, offering of hot and cool storage and making it uh, consistent uh, with those tiers as well. So all valid uh, archive operations are 100% um, API consistent with um, hot and cool tiers as well. And, and customers enjoy the same scalability, durability, and security um, options as the rest of our um, uh, object storage offering. So when it comes to redundancy, for examples, you have um, uh, both LRS and GRS options. Um, LRS is a locally redundant storage where we will store multiple copies of your da data um, within uh, a single data center in a region. Um, and that gives you at least 11 nines of durability. And um, uh, that goes all the way up to GRS, which is geo-redundant storage, which gives, which gives you at least 16 nines of durability. And um, uh, the way it differs from LRS is we store the same number of copies in another region that's um, typically 100 miles apart. So it also protects against um, uh, natural disasters within a region. There were a few topics that uh, Sally had mentioned would be of interest to this group. So I'll try to cover um, uh, 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 specific uh, points on those, um, uh, but free to answer any other questions that people may have. Um, so in, in regards to durability and data fixity, um, when data is stored in archive storage, it cannot be modified um, and all override uh, operations fail. Um, so from that perspective, if anything is in archive, there's no way to accidentally modify it. Um, uh, however, someone could retrieve that data. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, so when, when data is in archive, uh, you can't read it, uh, nor can you overwrite it. You, uh, however, the metadata is still online. So you can do um, a lot of operations such as get blob properties or lit, list blobs and still get information about your objects. Um, if you want to actually modify it, um, then you would have to issue what we call a rehydrate operation um, that can take uh, several hours to complete. And that uh, moves your data from archive back to um, hot and cool. 
and then you can make changes there as well. We're also coming out with a feature that will allow you to retrieve a copy. So if you still want to maintain a copy of the data in archive, um, but still want to pull something out uh, just to read it or modify it, you'll, ha you'll have that ability as well. Um, some of the other features we have that help with that is um, uh, when you have uh, uh, objects stored, you can um, take snapshots and snapshots are always immutable. So that gives you a guaranteed uh, version of your data that cannot be modified. Um, uh, we also have uh, two, uh, a feature just recently released called soft delete. Um, and what that does is if you accidentally overwrite or delete your data in any of our storage tiers, hot, cool, or archive, um, we will maintain a um, uh, copy of that uh, for a certain period of time that's defined by the user. So this is meant for accidental deletions where the user can go back and restore that copy again. And then we also have a feature um, called Worm uh, coming out, uh, which will allow you to sp uh, um, specify a lock on your data, uh, which will prevent anyone from deleting or modifying it. And uh, however, you still can change the tiers of that data. So. If you want to apply, for example, a multi-year policy where no one can tamper the data, um, you can keep it in archive, but if you want to read it, you can restore it and, and still do that while um, making sure the policy is still um, active and valid. Um, in regards to data import and export, um, uh, Julian earlier uh, uh, talked about Snowball. Um, uh, Azure also has uh, similar capabilities and um, you can use uh, transfer data over the wire. Um, we also have something called Express Route that allows you, that gives you a dedicated uh, pipe to do that a lot faster. Um, however, if you want to move mass amounts of data uh, in a very short amount of time, we also have something in preview called uh, Data Box, which is very similar to Snowball um, and allows you to um, move up to, um, I believe, 80 to 100 terabytes uh, in a uh, specific box that you ship, and then we automatically migrate that data to your storage account. Um, to uh, export that data, um, uh, currently there's no option uh, to do it in a uh, mass uh, export uh, option where you're where using a device, but uh, those are certainly options that we can explore in the future. So if there are certain scenarios that people are interested in, uh, please do reach out to me directly. Um, but currently uh, to retrieve data from uh, archive, you do have to rehydrate that data to the hot and cool tiers um, and then read the data from there. And then finally, I wanted to cover a few things regarding um, security and privacy. So anything that is stored is automatically um, uh, encrypted by default. Um, uh, we are also GDPR compliant. Um, I mentioned Worm um, uh, earlier. This is a feature that's in preview and um, allows us to meet uh, uh, SEC financial requirements, but also it can be used to uh, put uh, certain holds on your data so it's not modified or tampered with for a certain period of time. Um, we also have um, RBAC now, which is role-based access control uh, that integrates with Azure Active um, Directory. So you can assign specific roles to uh, storage accounts and groups and um, assign those to certain users so that you can have a super user that has access to everything, um, including the keys, whereas certain users that only have access to read the data and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then Azure Key Fault um, allows you to manage your keys, but also uh, gives you the option to bring your own keys as well. Uh, so that if you were to revoke those, um, no one including Azure could dec decrypt um, and access the data. Um, so that's, uh, that covers primarily the main topics that I wanted to cover. So I'll open the floor up for any questions that any, uh, anyone may have. Kumail, you talked about um, that the data is uh, Im immutable. Um, when it's in the cold storage, but could you talk about um, how you protect against bit rot or bit decay and how you uh, measure to make sure that the, the file is still uh, the same, that there hasn't been lost versus just counting on the system to make sure there hasn't been lost? Sure. 
Um, so we have uh, several internal processes that are doing end-to-end -end validation of all the data to check for bit rot. Um, and if uh, when it is discovered, because we have multiple copies, we have self-healing capabilities um, uh, to protect against that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, es essentially, um, we have several CRC checks um, and um, MD5 uh, hashing that we're using to kind of uh, regularly uh, check the data to make sure that it's still, uh, that the um, integrity is still there and there's no bit rot or any bits that are lost. Thank you. Are, are you able to share what the storage medium is? Um, uh, I can uh, I can share what it can include. So uh, for uh, our standard, uh, standard storage offering, which uh, includes our hot and cool storage, which object storage is on, and then um, uh, 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 some, some of our other storage uh, offerings, such as files, that is on hard disk. And we have um, uh, uh, options where you can get premium storage that, that's on SSD for faster performance and lower latency. Um, archive storage uh, can, uh, uh, can take advantage of a multiple different hardware. Uh, and uh, our goal is to basically choose the hardware that optimizes costs that we, so we can continue to offer uh, a, a low price. And that can include not only hard disk, but also things like tape storage as well. Uh, but, the, but the key thing to remember is that um, uh, regardless of the underlying hardware, uh, the um, uh, SLAs and the uh, durability and security promises that we're providing, those still remain constant. All right, yeah. great. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nathan. Was it me? Thank you. <laughs> I saw there was a question, um, are there data box options that would support migration from tape um, LTO6? Um, so uh, the, we just recently launched a program with um, several different uh, partners where um, uh, these partners specialize in basically going in and um, liberating data from any type of medium, uh, um, uh, which includes tapes in any version that they were uh, written in and uh, helping them migrate that to the cloud using Databox or something else. Um, uh, so uh, I can provide a, a link to that and more information, uh, Mark, if you're interested. Uh, feel free to send me a note um, and I can send more details on that. All right, great. Um, there's one more question that's come up in the chat. Um, Arif. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, apologies if not. Are, are the details of internal integrity processes recorded somewhere as part of the preservation metadata associated with the data being preserved? If so, can these metadata be queried? Yeah, great question. So that isn't true today. Um, uh, we're, we're very confident in our processes and one of the things uh, we uh, uh, provide is that uh, for, for, for example, on Azure Dist, uh, we're one of the only providers that offers a 0% AFR annual failure rate, and we've never lost any data. Um, uh, however, uh, uh, the checks that we're doing, there's nothing that we do to update the metadata um, that will indicate that. Uh, we have been kind of thinking about this scenario. I know this is something um, Sally and the Gates Archive team has asked for as well, um, uh, about, um, you know, can there be some type of uh, metadata flag or something that indicates that um, instead of the customer going through and actually accessing the data, um, if we could do that on their behalf and, and um, uh, somehow uh, provide um, uh, uh, some type of metadata that would indicate that that's been done. Uh, so we are exploring that. If you have more details on, you know, what you would want that to look like, uh, please do uh, reach out to me. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing more. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think we should move on um, to our next presenter. It's been a couple minutes. So, um, so yeah, if you have more questions for Camille, please like note them down um, and we can cover those at the end. Uh, all right. So next up, uh, we have uh, John Mallory from Amazon Web, Web Services. John, are you on the call?
John, you might be muted if you are on. All right, it looks like um, it looks like we may not have John on. Okay. Um, oops. All right, so um, in that case, I'll just go ahead and uh, wrap things up by very quickly um, telling you a little bit about the NDSA um, cloud studies group that has recently been formed. So I have just a super simple presentation. I'll share my screen. Um, so the cloud studies group. Um, I'm, I'm a member of this group. Um, it started basically earlier this year out of some conversations that were happening in the uh, NDSA content interest group. Um, and a big part of that motivation was um, there was, there was a great amount of interest in uh, the implication of using cloud platforms uh, for digital preservation work. Uh, so, in particular, as I note here, um, Matt Schultz, who's one of the co-chairs, um, has been interested in how transfer of content from cloud platforms, including, um, you know, G Suite and other sort of cloud document storage um, platforms, um, what kind of implications that has for digital preservation. Um, so Matt Schultz from Grand Valley and um, Lauren Work from UVA um, are the co-chairs of that group. And neither of them were available today, so they have deputized me to <laughs> give, give you all this blurb about them. Um, and um, basically this group meets on, um, on a monthly basis so far. Um, I've included a link to the notes um, of the discussions that we've had so far. I'll make sure that this presentation gets posted as well. Um, basically, we've started to consolidate some, um, we've just started uh, to put some cloud and digital preservation um, resources into an OSF project um, and are very actively interested in um, other documentation or resources that you think might be useful to um, the digital preservation community uh, related to cloud. Um, and, and it's worth also mentioning that, you know, I mentioned the original motivation was for the formation of this group was around implications of transfer um, to repositories, but the scope has certainly broadened beyond that. And you can see that from the list of um, these couple of examples of work underway. Um, and anyone is welcome to join the calls um, or these initiatives. So um, Lauren has recently um, kicked off or is kicking off some work to test cloud recovery um, of data. Um, and the group has also been providing feedback on um, some related initiatives. So um, and or contributing to them. So there was an effort to um, get information um, from various cloud storage providers about um, how Fixity is handled. Um, there's also, many of you may be aware, um, a, a document out of the digital preservation community, the preservation storage criteria um, that we've discussed um, and provided some feedback on and folks um, from the group that created that have joined some of the cloud studies calls to discuss it. Um, and Matt has also connected in with um, Luciana Duranti and the folks at Inner Pares about um, some work that they have uh, underway um, under this umbrella project, Records in the Cloud. Um, 
So I won't give you all of the details of those initiatives if you're interested. Um, I would definitely refer you to um, the meeting notes um, because there's a lot of good information there. So that was very short. That was my very short uh, <laughs> blurb. Um, and with that, are there any questions about um, NDSA cloud studies? Could you drop a link to those slides in the notes, Sally? Uh, yes, I will do that. Thanks. Cool. All right. Um, so we still have about 14 minutes um, left and some really interesting and um, smart people on the call. I think uh, before wrapping up, I want to say thank you again um, to Julian and Bill and, uh, and Kumail um, who all presented on, you know, relatively short notice. That was fantastic. Um, so thanks to, thanks to all of you. Um, and with that, are there any sort of final questions for uh, the panelists or lightning talkers today? I, I did have a follow-up question um, actually for you, Julian. Um, so just to confirm and boil down um, where you're headed in terms of um, migrating data to, um, to S3 and Glacier, are you planning, are you sort of planning a phased approach where um, you are gonna be looking to move all data into S3 slash Glacier and removing local copies? And then you mentioned you're also sort of looking at some other potential providers yeah, so it's a phased approach. Um, the plan is to not touch our existing systems at all, run Prescat in parallel whilst we seed um, AWS. And once we've done that and we're sure the system is working, we'll add some additional endpoints. And once all that's done, we're just going to stop using TSM for backups. We will always have a local online copy of Moab. Um, that's a part of data sovereignty thing, and it's partly uh, to satisfy the instant access requirements of our, of our upstream systems. So the intention is to replace TSM eventually with multiple different vendors, in multiple different geographical locations uh, for the archive copies of Moab, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Thank you. And would you be keeping a local copy of all preservation and access sort of derivative data? Yes. So the um, the access copies, which are on it. So I, the access copy of objects can be the preservation copy, or it could be a derivative from the uh, from the um, uh, delivery stacks. Uh, yes, those are all staying local. So there will be one fully uncompressed preservation copy, which is used for access of uncompressed originals, and also the derivative copy uh, of that same data will be kept local. Great. Thank you. Um, just to go back to, I see in the chat, um, in response to the conversation, um, with Kumail about um, metadata, about uh, fixity checking um, and other kind of integrity checking. Um, Arif notes, it would be cool to have such metadata recorded in premise. And I see there's a plus one on that. <laughs> one of the things you mentioned uh, uh, Sally is part of the, the cloud studies group um, as the sort of related activities that you were uh, providing feedback to is the preservation storage criteria. 
Um, that happens to be the topic of our next meeting um, in August uh, with Jane presenting, Jane Mandelbaum presenting on the preservation storage criteria document and that group and the effort that's been underway. Um, so we should be able to get to hear more about that at the next meeting. Um, I also wanted to give a brief update um, at the last, the last meeting uh, we've had and at a couple ones prior to that, um, I had been mentioning a um, working group spinning up to, uh, to conduct a storage survey um, that had the, been conducted twice in the past, looking to run it again. It's been a while since it's run and perhaps more routinize um, to make that happen regularly. Um, there's a, a proposal right now sitting with the coordinating committee to form a, a working group to, to take on that work. Um, when the coordinating committee uh, is, is finished with that, there probably will be a, um, another call for participation in some level. Um, and we'll bring that back up at this, with this group here um, to talk about as well. Um, but it looks like that's probably going to be going forward and happen uh, sometime in 2019. And that's gen a general survey on storage infrastructure across NDA institutions. Although I suppose they don't have to be NDSA. It could be any, any institution. Um, but we're connecting the survey. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Nathan. All right. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was probably doing the same thing you were, Sally, just, just wrapping up. So why don't you take it? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So if there, um, if there aren't any further questions, um, we'll leave it there. And uh, thanks once again for joining. And a special thanks to um, Julian and Bill and Kumail. Thanks, all. Have a all great right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Oh, Sally, Aaron B. is looking for Bill's contact info. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll put that into the chat. Cool. You can put it into the notes, maybe? Yeah, I'll do that. That'll be, that'll be easier. Okay. Thanks.